Hello and welcome to ShakeTube episode five. We are now a third of the way done with ShakeTube. Holy cow, that's five plays deep. Uh, there's still 10 more to go, but that's a pretty good pace here. Uh, I actually thought with ShakeTube we'd be going in a chronological order, but this week we're looking at a play that happened previous to Julius Caesar. This happened around the 15, mid-1590s uh, as opposed to the late 1590s with Julius Caesar, but uh, today we're talking about... A Midsummer Night's Dream. Just kicking it right off here, I've absolutely loved all of the genre shifts that have been going on with all these Shakespeare plays. We've not only had the political dramas with Richard III, the look at a lot of psychological themes with Julius Caesar, or the tragic romance with Romeo and Juliet. Now we're looking into a comic fantasy romance here with A Midsummer Night's Dream, and it's really kept all of the plays fresh and exciting, even though there are some themes that cross over. Uh, I've just liked that they've all had these unique aspects to them. At the beginning, it sets up really nicely with four different plot lines that are bound to converge. There are a lot of characters that are planning on going out to the forest, but at first it all centers around the fact that Theseus and Hippolyta are going to get married. And there are a lot of preparations like with the cast of actors that are going to rehearse a play to perform during that wedding. There is the matchmaking drama with Lysander, Hermia, and Demetrius. There's also the fantasy... Uh, romantic drama with Oberon and Titania and it was really exciting at the beginning just to keep seeing them say that they were going to start to come together as far as their different plot lines they all started saying they were going to go to the forest at various moments and it just had me thinking what mischief is going to come out of all of this planning and all these plot lines acted as a foundation that really held up this overall great atmosphere for the play. That was the thing that I probably liked the most about it, especially when you started getting into the middle of the play. I just think the setting of the forest really was very distinct. It felt uh, hazy is something that I would kind of say. It's It just kind of added to the fact that this was looking into a lot more themes of fantasy and there were a lot of mythological references, which of course happened in other plays, but here they were augmented from the fact that a lot of these myths were real in this particular story because there were already fantasy elements that were coming out. All of these myths could coexist within the same story, and I enjoyed having all of those references come out where the gods... Uh, within their respective myths had uh, a, a lot of history that allowed characters to point to moments in time where they started to foreshadow what potentially would be happening to them within this plot line or just make you feel more in touch to nature itself. Because, of course, like I said, the setting of the forest was such an important part to the feeling of this play, but then you even get references to the moon and the gods that are related to that, and the fact that they gave the moon this elemental field, a watery moon, for instance, was something that they continued to re refer to the moon as because of its uh, obvious power over the tides, but it just added this extra fantastical element to it, and I think that in the middle there, it, it couldn't be beat, but unfortunately, uh, as I got along, I didn't feel like a lot of that panned out in a satisfying way, but when I was in the middle, that was at a point where none of the plays had really created an atmosphere like that, and that was something that I really appreciated about A Midsummer Night's Dream. But it is funny seeing all the reference material that is cited. Shakespeare really had some obvious influences for his work. Uh, on the side of this edition, like I've mentioned in the past, there are a lot of annotations that will either clear up some sentences that might not make sense in modern English, but it also plays a role of highlighting a lot of these references to these mythological stories or showing where Shakespeare might have pulled some of this reference material from. And so two of the uh, places that he pulled from were actually from other plays as well, but it was Ovid's Metamorphoses and Plutarch's Lives, which I talked a little bit about for the Julius Caesar video, but 
obviously these two pieces of work uh, really influenced Shakespeare quite a bit because he was able to craft multiple plays out of the material that he found within uh, both of these books. And I thought that that was pretty cool. And again, I just kind of have lists that maybe I won't pick up for years and years, but I have been pretty good about knowing that I have certain books that I'm looking forward to getting into at some point. And I think those two have definitely made the list because it just sounds like there's a lot of fantastic material that would really uh, open up my mind as to the mindset of that particular period of time, uh, both for Shakespeare reading it and in the uh, ancient context in which they were written. And I will say, all of these aspects of myth and fantasy really brought in a more satisfying lyrical verse style. I think that this was used way more effectively than it was in Romeo and Juliet, which a lot of people told me in that video that they so enjoyed the dialogue in Romeo and Juliet, which I did as well. There are a lot of beautiful lines, but I thought sometimes that lyrical verse, that true-to-form uh, iambic pentameter along with the rhyme scheme at the end, uh, when it's in its actual originally intended form. Uh, it could be cheesy in Romeo and Juliet, but here it was used to show that that fantasy had kind of taken over the scene. And in particular, uh, with Robin Goodfellow, a lot of times with his uh, monologues, it would break even from that perfect verse. Of course, when he was talking to Oberon, they would both kind of follow that uh, lyrical verse style perfectly to a T, but when Robin was by himself and even creating more mischief, it broke down that formula of having the iambic pentameter with 10 syllables per line or approximately that and made it even shorter. And it still had that rhyme scheme, but it just really added to this entire aspect of fantasy where every time you read it, you know that you were deep in it. And again, I thought that that really added to the atmosphere of the play overall and just really do think that it was executed a lot better here than in a lot of moments in Romeo and Juliet. I stuttered there because I know people are attacking me for that. But overall, I just didn't laugh as much as I was expecting to with this being a really famous comedy in Shakespeare's entire catalog. When it got most mischievous, even when the love triangle started to break down and they had Lysander and Demetrius going after Helena and she started taking it uh, as if they were playing a joke on her. I, I didn't find it that funny. I actually felt really bad for Helena because you could just feel her pain in that moment where even when things were going her way, how could it have been that way? Of course, there were otherworldly uh, things going on to make that situation form in that way, but she just wasn't taking kindly to it. And even when it got to the end where she did end up getting her way, it didn't have a satisfying conclusion to that, especially because it didn't feel like it was something that was totally natural and you didn't get any uh, afterthought to that. It just kind of happened. Everybody watched the play at the end and that was that. And of course, you could justify it with the monologue at the end with Robin Goodfellow, basically telling you this whole thing could have been a dream, but I just don't think that there are a lot of funny moments. And even when it got to its peak where I thought that that should have been the point where it would have been something that would have had me rolling or whatever, uh, it just didn't quite do that. And so that's why I still really think that the atmosphere was overall the best thing. And I, and I don't hold that against it. And I think that this is the case for a lot of plays. I've said this multiple times. If I saw it in person, sure, that might be a lot better because there would be a lot of physical comedy as well. You could tell that there were moments that were made to have that physical comedy, even with uh, the actors, but with the uh, people in the forest as well, with Lysander and Demetrius and Helena. Um, and so I will just wait to pass full judgment again until... Uh, I can have a moment where maybe it's on YouTube, just kind of check it out for myself and see uh, what happens there. But as it stands, the second play at the end really felt superfluous because a lot of what the story was building to kind of felt resolved already. And I know that it had to come back to the beginning 
where it comes to that initial marriage with Theseus and Hippolyta. But I just felt like it kind of dragged on after the fact, and it could have really done a lot more with that setting in the forest because there was so much magic that was going on at that time. And I just think that there was a lot of opportunity missed because that world was built up so well. And so I I just think maybe if there were other interpretations, focusing on the forest and building up that world would be the way to go. But what do I know? I'm no Shakespeare. Or am I? Honestly, I don't even know if there are any other plays that are coming up for ShakeTube that have that fantasy vibe to them. Uh, But as it stands, despite my criticisms, as I've said a couple times in the video, the point where they were in the forest and a lot of the magic was coming together and a lot of the mythological references were coming together with the different creatures and everything, that was just an incredible part. And that was something that I lost myself in. And I think that that would be so amazing to see if it's done correctly. Like I said, it just kind of felt like it was this hazy dream. It felt like it was a forest that was kind of in a dusky blue setting. And I could just totally picture it, even just reading the script here. And so I think that the fact that that was able to be created within this format without actually putting set pieces up, that just was an incredible thing. And so despite a lot of those criticisms, uh, it was still absolutely a worthwhile play to read for that alone. I won't lie, there were parts that I did get kind of confused. For some reason, this seemed like it was the most difficult play for me to read so far. I know other people had harder times with some of the earlier plays. I had heard from a few people that Richard III was pretty confusing as well, but maybe it was because I was tired when I was reading Uh, on some of the nights this week, but I might have lost a couple moments, and so that would definitely be on me. Uh, And this deserves a reread because of that, but uh, like I said, I think I will at least try to get on YouTube and look at a few productions just to see a few key scenes that I really enjoyed and see how that changes the experience overall. And I know that there are a couple sources online that I will be checking out just to make sure I have everything pretty clear. But that's about it for a Midsummer Night's Dream. I I think there will be a lot of dissenters in the crowd. Uh, There were a few people that said that a Midsummer Night's Dream was their favorite Shakespeare play, and I can see why for sure. Um, But I I think that there were still others that have topped the list for me so far and I have decided now that I've committed to this now that I am over a third of the way through ShakeTube at the end I'm planning on doing a personal ranking of all of the 15 plays that we'll be reading which I think will be pretty tough and will be a controversial video I can definitely see that but I think it'll be a lot of fun to really wrap it up at the end. So that does it for A Midsummer Night's Dream. Next week, we are looking at The Merchant of Venice, and be on the lookout at the beginning of next week. I have a request video coming up for some suggestions for something I'll be doing in October. It has a pretty obnoxious name, and I'm excited to uh, just chat a little bit more about that at that time. But thanks for checking out another episode of ShakeTube. See you next week. (laughs) 